couple weeks back, I attended my first South by Southwest Film Festival. So today I'm gonna stop and rank all 14 South by Southwest films that I saw from my least favorite to the best. Hi, my name is Sean and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Which of the movies discussed in this video are you most interested in checking out when it finally releases? With a video like this, sure, I want to give my thoughts on the big mainstream headliners like The Fall Guy and Civil War, but more so, hopefully I can put some movies on your radar that you hadn't heard of before. And to that point, even though I saw 14 movies in a week, I missed the majority of movies that played at South by Southwest. So later in the video, I will have a section where I interviewed a bunch of people that I ran into there, asked them what their favorite movie from the festival is, and almost every single one of them recommended some film that I missed. And so hopefully we can put some movies on your radar that you haven't heard of up to this point in time. With all that said, Let's get started. In least favorite place, Azrael. Now to be perfectly clear, everyone else I talked to at the festival that saw this film seemed to like it more than I did. Azrael, uh, it's the new Simon Bar written by Simon Barrett film. Um, I, that man never does me no wrong. It's Samara Weaving. It's no dialogue heaven, but it's all adrenaline. It's all gas, no breaks. I love that one too. I think I'll, if you've been a big fan of everyone involved in that, it's, it's easy to recommend. For whatever reason, this one didn't connect with me the way it did with every other person that I talked to. Now, this is a Samara Weaving kind of survival horror film from the writer of the movie, You're Next. I love the movie, You're Next. And I actually didn't realize that it was the writer of You're Next that wrote this film until after the movie played and he came up and did an Q and A afterwards and said he wrote your next. I was like, oh, I wonder if I'd watched the movie with that context, if it would have shaped my impression of it. So in the movie, essentially it's set in a post-apocalyptic setting after the rapture has happened. And a large group of people basically have decided that they will not talk anymore because uh, their sin of speech. And so they've cut their vocal cords. So it's a movie with no dialogue in it. And essentially you're following Samara weaving in a guy trying to survive where there's this murderous cult trying to track them down. And so survival horror. And there's like these people called the burnt people that are basically zombies want roaming around. I think the reason that the movie didn't pop more for me is that we've seen other survival movies like this where we're in a post-apocalyptic setting and it turns out the humans are just as bad as the creatures roaming the earth. We've seen that many times before. And what could have made this one pop and sort of makes it pop a little bit is the lore that it is tied to like the Bible post-rapture. There's some stuff with a pregnant woman and prophecies kind of going on and sacrifices to God. And there's a cool lore there, I think, but without dialogue you're not able to really dive into it. But at a certain point in time, I just had too many questions, too many frustrations where I was like, wait, why is this person here? Why are they there? Did they come from this? So I left the movie frustrated and not as fulfilled as I wanted to be by the end of it. Number 13, Immaculate, and this movie actually released this past weekend. I was at its world premiere with Sydney Sweeney in attendance, and I was actually in the front row of the theater. So when she did the Q&A afterwards, she was like 10 feet in front of me, which was a very cool experience and a very fun way to watch a movie like this. Now, I, I went into this movie pretty skeptical just in general because I'm not really into non-horror. <laughs> That's just not a genre that, generally speaking, I gravitate towards. So I didn't really know what to make of it. And for the first half of the film, it was kind of exactly what I was afraid it was going to be, which is just jump scares. After a wild night of jump scares, a nun finds out she's pregnant. And that's the whole first half of the movie. I mean, it even has a scene where someone looks out a window and then there's a jump scare of a bird crashing into the window, right? which we've seen a zillion times before in a million other movies. Then you get into the back half of the film where it starts to reveal what's happening. You're like, oh, that's what we're doing? Okay, this is weird and bonkers enough that 
Now you've caught my attention. Now, it took you 60% of the movie to catch my attention, but you did catch my attention. And the third act, it kind of turns into more action, revenge, very much my kind of thing, paying off really nicely of just where the journey it takes this nun on and her lashing out. And then in the final shot of the movie, which is it's like a two minute shot, <laughs> it's like the thing that everyone talks about coming out of the film, whether that's about Sidney Sweeney's performance where she goes for it and then what they actually do in the final shot of the movie. I couldn't decide if I like respected that the, the movie had enough balls to do this or if I was just deeply offended at where this movie goes in general in the back half of the film. But to its credit, it did something worth talking about. As for me overall, like this is just not a movie I'm likely to rewatch. It's fine. It'll offend some people. Some people really appreciate it. <laughs> Number 12, Roadhouse. Now this is another one where I was at the world premiere of the film, which is the most fun way to watch a movie like this because Jake Gyllenhaal, Post Malone, Conor McGregor, and the rest of the cast, they were all in the room. Even Doug Lyman was in the room. He just didn't go on stage because he was like protesting whatever went down with all of this. Uh, I posted a full review of it, so I don't want to go into too much detail in this video. I want to more focus on the films I haven't covered and won't cover with individual videos. But overall, I thought it was fun. And even maybe if I should adjust its placement on this ranking, I rewatched it a couple days ago once it dropped on Amazon Prime, watched it with my wife, but I feel like it lost what made the original Roadhouse unique, which was it was the bar fight movie. It was the bouncer movie. And because Dalton is an, a UFC fighter in this, his backstory, his philosophy, it just drives it in a different direction. So it just kind of becomes just another story about the outsider comes into town and cleans things up. The movie even points this out, that uh, this is basically a Western. I kind of dug that they used like these wide angle lenses and got really up and close to shoot everything and did long takes, but they also did a bunch of CGI to like make the punches hit when they weren't actually hitting. And so it just looks off. They messed with the timing, the speed. And so it's a mixed bag. So it's totally watchable, but generic. Last night we were able to watch Roadhouse at the world premiere. Finally, I met Jared in real life. We've known each other on the internet for what, six, six years? years. Yeah, it's finally, been a while. finally met in real life. What do you think about Roadhouse? I thought, I mean, again, in the room it was explosive. People were cheering, having a great time. I thought it was very action packed. Sydney, what do you think about it? Honestly, I ultimately really liked Roadhouse. And As for the remake, I enjoyed it less than the original. The thing is, surprisingly funny. It was surprisingly super funny. Uh, it does have some good things about it. Arturo Castro plays a henchman who is really funny. McGregor, he's bananas. I think my favorite part was Conor McGregor. I also found Conor McGregor really distracting and not a good actor. It's but like yeah. it's it's more like swagger at this moment. It's just his personality oh, more so than like a performance. He's but. Fully naked, like <laughs> swagger walking around. It's kind of crazy, and in my opinion, the best part of the movie. But I thought the action was really. You strong. said the best part of the movie was him walking around naked. Well, okay, don't. <laughs> Don't twist my words, Sean. Jesus. <laughs> there is a, a death by animal. That uh, that sequence is really great. Yeah, I was actually really shocked that I enjoyed it, but I had a really, really good time. So you would recommend it? I would recommend it. It's on Prime Video. Why not throw it on? Uh, ultimately, I would say if you want to sit down and watch a Roadhouse movie, I would recommend just watching the original for the first time or re-watching the original. Next up, family. And to be perfectly clear, pretty much everything else on here, I enjoyed the films. Um, even being kind of low on this list, that doesn't mean I didn't like it. It just means... I enjoyed pretty much everything that I saw. I, I enjoyed Roadhouse, I enjoyed Immaculate. So it was actually a really good film festival with a lot of movies that, that worked for me or I found interesting or I appreciated they, that I got to see them like in the case of Azrael, I appreciated I got to see it though, you know, it didn't fully work for me on that particular viewing. So when it comes to the movie Family, it's a film that feels like it's in close proximity to a number of other films, another of other horror films. 
but it doesn't neatly fit into one box. It's not quite a haunted house movie. It's not quite a possession movie. It's not quite a relic movie, but it kind of has elements of each of those different genres. Kind of at the, the center of the story is there's like the, this birdhouse, bird feeder that, that might be haunted and it might be talking to this girl. It might be making the mom go crazy. It may, might be making the girl go crazy, but you don't know who's going crazy or exactly what's going on. And at the same time, it's an exploration of Greece, grief, loss, tragedy and using the horror elements to kind of be a visual manifestation of those deeper themes being explored. Once again, not my type of horror film. It's not the type that I rewatch or just go to a lot, but an interesting little film that, like I said, could be familiar, but also feel like it's pulling from a lot of different places and exploring it in a bit of an interesting way. Today's video is brought to you by BetterHelp. If you don't know my story, when I started my YouTube channel, I was unemployed and in alcohol addiction treatment. And my addiction issues came about because I just had a tremendous amount of stress in my life and I coped with that stress through drinking. I wish 10 years ago I had turned to therapy instead of alcohol. Therapy could have helped me develop proper coping skills for all the stress that I was facing. And it could have helped me steer my life away from really toxic patterns. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash Sean Chandler today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Sean Chandler. Bringing us into the top 10, cuckoo. This is another one that I appreciated it. There was a lot that I enjoyed about it, but it's not the type of horror film that I naturally gravitate towards. It's very atmospheric where this girl goes to this place where she can tell something's weird, something's off, but we don't know what it is. We don't know what's happening. And th things keep getting weirder and crazier as the movie goes along until we finally figure out what's happening and we get this bonkers third <laughs> act where everything comes to a head. Um, Dan Stevens is in it and gives like this perfectly charming and creepy performance. Like he has this affability to him, but always you're like, Something is definitely off with this guy right here. It's a nice mix of scary place, investigation, insanity, action, superpowers, conspiracy, all at the same time. And if you like stories about a person at this weird place and then things go crazy, you'll probably enjoy this film and it's got its own nice little spin on all of that. And like for me, it was one that I felt like it got better as it went along. And as you got more answers and it got weirder and crazier and bonkers and like the action kicks into it, it was more kind of my thing. But once again, like I dug the film. I had a good time with it. There were just other films I enjoyed more. What was your favorite film from South by Southwest? You might as well just pull it on up there real quick. We got our cuckoo. Loved it. I knew I was going to love it. It feels so genre. It's genre bunch. It's gonzo. I think it's only worked for a small niche of people. People who like their movies to be outrageous, outlandish, and just a wild ass time. That's me. I had a great time with Cuckoo. If you've loved Tillman Singer's other films, you're going to love this film. Number nine, Time Stalker. This was the first film that I saw at the festival. I did not know anything about what the film was about or anything like that, sat down and just knew it kind of had a, a time element to it. And essentially, it's about this lady that becomes obsessed with this man and she keeps being reincarnated and in each different time period, she's still obsessed with this one guy. And so, you know, we're in France, we're in the 80s and all these different time periods hopping around 
watching her have this delusional fixation with this man, it could be really, really funny at times. <laughs> like, it just, it's so wild and unpredictable that it had me laughing out loud many, many times. It's very unpredictable in how it'll have sudden bursts of violence and just even where things kind of go. And it's all kind of exploring this idea of unrequited love. There's this woman that never really learns and grows and changes despite multiple lifetimes of pursuing this man. Uh, it was made, you know, on a very low budget and shot in only 22 days. And all things considered, how many time periods they're in and everything they're trying to do, it looks really good with all of that in mind. It has like a nice dreamy vibe to it like you feel and then time stalker which yeah. i mentioned first uh, one we watched yeah the first movie of the festival i really liked it it is uh written directed and starring alice lowe who is in from hot fuzz uh, and also co-stars nick frost from hot fuzz and some of the other uh edgar wright and simon pegg films romantic dark comedy uh about a woman pursuing her dream man through uh lifetime after lifetime of reincarnation uh and it's Little very death. yeah and very stylized but i really enjoyed it number eight Y2K. This is a comedy directed by Kyle Mooney of Saturday Night Live fame. It has Rachel Ziegler and there's one of our, our main actresses in the film. And the basic premise is a bunch of high schoolers go to a party on New Year's Eve going into Y2K. If you're younger and don't remember, there was this big crazy thing where we thought maybe the computers were all going to shut down at the turn of the century because of a programming bug and maybe the world was going to end because of this Y2K bug in computers. And then it turned out to be absolutely nothing. So the premise of this movie is what if it wasn't nothing and things go bonkers? I went into the movie not knowing much more than that and how bonkers, crazy, and weird it was going to get. The first 30, 20, 30 minutes of it is essentially that, and the humor is basically, hey, remember Blockbuster? Hey, remember America Online? Hey, remember how long it took to download pictures off the internet back in the day? And then the movie kicks into high gear when midnight strikes and things go horrible and it turns all sorts of crazy and insane and violent and gory and gets way better once that kicks in. And then it was a wild, fun ride. It's very randomly, excessively violent. It's outright bonkers. There's a cameo in this movie that I hope isn't spoiled by the, like the, the trailers or anything like that that is just fantastic. It's a musician that has a prominent role in the last, I don't know, 20, 15 minutes of the film. Perfect, amazing. I, I loved it. And uh, so a, a movie that starts off pretty generic and then turns into a lot of fun. Y2K is like a demented Amblin movie. Uh, <laughs> Uh, That's a good way to put it, yeah. Yeah, like I'm, I'm a fan of Kyle Mooney's work on SNL and stuff, so I knew it would have a, a strange sense of humor, but I wasn't expecting it to also kind of echo those 80s, 80s Spielberg productions and mix the two. Number seven, Arcadian. And this is an a Quiet Place-esque post-apocalyptic horror film with a lot of family vibes to it. It doesn't have the sound element from A Quiet Place, but it does have Nicolas Cage in the film. But very much how A Quiet Place was about this family and how they were learning to survive in this world. This is about a family trying to survive in this world. This one is a, really about two brothers and how they fight with each other, how they get along with each other, how they love each other, how they're the same, how they're different, and how they're trying to survive in this horrifying world. This is a film that I've seen before, but this is a good version of it. It's a genre entry, it's familiar, but it's a good version of it. And the big thing that elevates it, besides the fact that anytime you put Nicolas Cage into a genre film, you have something new and interesting in it, is the creature design. The first time they introduce the creature, it's this long, wide shot involving a door, and 
it keeps like revealing more about this creature. And you think the shot's about to end and the scene's about to, or, and we're about to move on. And then it keeps just revealing more about the creature. And like, like truly unsettling. And then when you see the creatures, they have like this snapping jaw thing that they do that everyone was talking about act after watching the film. That it's just like this, whoa, that's, that's cool. I haven't seen that before. That's wild. And they do other things with the way that the creatures interact with each other and what they're doing, that that's really kind of what elevates the film. There's strong family dynamics. Um, but, you know, like I said, we've seen this before, but it's a good version of this type of film with a cool creature design that's doing something new and different. Arcadian, uh, the mon there are monsters that in it that are just terrifying and they continue to be surprising right. and terrifying. There's all these different ways they keep doing things like, uh oh, that yeah. too? Today's video is brought to you by Factor. I'm in a crazy busy period of life right now where I'm going to film festivals, comic cons, and trying to raise kids. Out of convenience, it's so easy to just eat junk. Eating better is easy with Factor's delicious, ready to eat meals. Every fresh, never frozen meal is chef crafted, dietitian approved, and ready to go in just two minutes. Factor's delicious meals are restaurant quality and they're ready to heat eat and eat whenever you are. No prep, no cooking skills required, and no cleanup. You'll have over 35 different options to choose from every week, including Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. I normally go for keto because I'm a high protein, low carb kind of guy. Also, there's more than 60 add-ons to help you stay fueled up and feeling good all day long. Discover a wide variety of easy options for the entire day like breakfast, midday bites, and more. Head to factormeals.com slash seanchandler50 and use code seanchandler50 to get 50% off. That's code SeanChandler50 at factormeals.com slash SeanChandler50 to get 50% off. Number six, my dead friend, Zoe. Now, this one is tough for me to talk about objectively because I was seated in the row right in front of the main actresses from the film, as well as their husbands. So as the movie was playing, I felt compelled to laugh at every single joke. And then when they started doing the Q&A, I felt compelled to stay and respond appropriately to everything they said because I didn't want their husbands who were right behind me to beat me up. All of that said, all of that said, essentially this is a dramedy of about a veteran with basically PTSD where about her friend that has died. And she's trying to figure out how to reconnect with society while at the same time, her grandpa is starting to have cognitive decline. And he's played by Ed Harris. And she's trying to take care of him. And through connecting with him and other things that happen, she's processing through all of her own struggles. The film was written and directed by a veteran, and essentially it was inspired by real life events and real life tragedies that he had, had dealt with and faced with his friends. And you can really feel that in the story that it's personal, it, it's potent, and it's even able to bring humor and levity into the story where I don't think you'd be able to if you hadn't been there. If it didn't ring true, you wouldn't be able to do what this movie's able to do. It's, it's subject matter. Those are all very heavy subject matter, but the movie has a very consistent sense of humor. It's very funny. And it's going back and forth, finding the, 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 the moments of joy and levity in the, the darkest of times and the way different people process through things. So I, I thought it was very effective. Number five, Monkey Man. This is another world premiere where Dev Patel was in attendance. So was Jordan Peele, who was one of the producers on the film. He introduced the movie and pretty much every movie plays great when they premiere in the Paramount Theater at South by Southwest. This is a hundred plus year old theater in downtown Austin, you know, just a block away from the Texas Capitol. Houdini performed shows in the Paramount Theater back in the day. Seats 1,200 people. 
And so you imagine if before you watch a movie, the star, the directors come out on stage, introduce the film, 1,200 people's a lot for a movie theater. It's a cool environment. You're at a film festival. You're the first public audience to see it. That's a cool environment. So they all play pretty great. Of all the movies I saw, there are 14 of them. Monkey Man was the only one that got a standing ovation. Got a two minute long standing ovation. Dev Patel walked out on stage. He was literally getting emotional, crying over the response from the room. So it was a cool way to see the film. I was very excited to see this one because I like action movies and it just looked to have a nice energetic style to it. Some people had been kind of, you know, people have used the language, this is Indian John Wick. I don't think that's a particularly good point of reference for this film. Sure, he wears a suit in the movie, it's stylized, he's in high-end swanky clubs, but, and it's an action movie, but it doesn't have like the relentless pacing of a John Wick film. It's much more thoughtful. It has a lot more culture in it. It's more kind of a, looking at a character uh, and it hit the tragedy that drove him to these actions. It's about um, the politics. It's like there's a whole lot in here, even tying in some of the lore that uh, he was he grew up reading and heard from his grandparents, things like that while pulling in influences from his favorite action movies, all of it kind of combined to this one thing. So it's, there's a little John Wick in there, but that's not primarily what this film is. And that's kind of probably some of the best and worst things about it. It has very much is trying to have its own identity and he wanted to infuse so much into it that there's probably a little bit too much in there. And it leads to some pacing issues where it takes a little while to get going and then it turns into a big, gigantic set piece and slows way down, rebuilds everything. Then a slam bang action sequence. But there's a lot of potential. There's a lot of cool stuff. There's a lot of just visceral, brutal action with its own distinct vibe to it. A lot of cool imagery and exploring things. Like it's aiming for it, doesn't quite get it, but you appreciate the ambition in the film. Oh my gosh, the action, the score, the soundtrack. I mean, it's mind blowing, incredible. I loved it. I had a blast. Really enjoyed it. Tons of action, action that I was not expecting. And 12th film at South by first standing ovation. It's great. Number four, Babes. This is a movie I went into with not a lot of information. I knew pregnancy tied into it. That was that was kind of it. This was the world premiere, and it really surprised me. Uh, the best point of reference probably for this film is that it, it's like Bridesmaids for Pregnancy, where Bridesmaids is a film about female friendships and how they change with time and how that can get messy with you know, a, a, a bridal party when there are different bridesmaids from different friend groups and what can come with that. And Babes kind of does that sort of exploration of female friendships and how they change and applies it to uh, pregnancy. And so it's very personal, relatable. You can feel see these little episodes probably were pulled from actual anecdotes in different people's lives. And it's really, really funny. It's able to get away with a lot of scatological and gross out humor that's entirely earned. Because pregnancies, they're they're <laughs> pretty wild. There, there's a lot of stuff that goes on, and so it, it just talks so bluntly about all of these elements of pregnancy amongst these two friends, and it it gets away with so much because it's real, it's grounded, it's not just going for shock value for shock value sake. But I mean, you just buy into their friendship and the complexities that kind of come with it. I will say this, it, it might have even been higher on this list and maybe it even should be lower. There's one plot point in it that I just felt was so out of sync with the rest of the movie, um, with kind of what goes down with the with the father. I don't know, like I, I could I see where they where they what the things they didn't want to do and the scenario that they wanted the woman in, which is the single mother, but just such like, a, I don't know, bizarre. Because everything else, I was like buying into the humor, the, the characters, the scenarios, the drama. And this one really important plot point, I was like, oh, that, that's not where I would have taken that. Other than that, um, I, I think that this is going to be a movie that uh, a lot of people are really going to enjoy.
So as I mentioned at the beginning of this, I saw 14 movies, but there's so many more movies that I didn't see. And so one of the things I wanted to do with this video was share some other people's favorite movies. I missed some movies that apparently were great, and I want you to hear about them and put as many things on your radar as is possible. One that really surprised me that I was top of my list before Civil War was Mama Faria. It's a- Oh, I didn't see this one, so perfect. It's very well-grounded, down to earth, and very relatable for anyone that's been the scenario in that type of story. I won't say much about it, but very well acted. Basically, it's, it represents life. It was actually a documentary. It's called Grand Theft Hamlet. It's about these out-of-work actors putting on a production of Hamlet within the world of Grand Theft Auto. It sounds very bizarre, but I found it incredibly endearing and very funny. So my favorite was Ghostlight. And actually, there's another film that's really good called Ghostlight. This is an independent film about grief and loss and how theater can help heal people and bring them together during the darkest periods of time. Which sounds also very depressing, but it is also very funny. <laughs> Funny and very emotional. Absolutely check that out when you have the chance. That was the best film that I saw here at South by Southwest. Whoa, wait, what's your Daisy Ridley movie? Oh, Magpie. I, di I, didn't, oh, I didn't catch that one. So you didn't you catch stuff? Magpie? No. So Magpie is definitely my favorite stuff so far. Also not because I'm a buyer, it's because I just met Daisy Ridley. Uh, that helps. So Magpie is the new Daisy Ridley joint and it's incredible. It's a domestic thriller. And you don't know what type of domestic thriller you're watching until as the movie, until the movie unravels more, and then when you realize, it almost becomes this like universal, like communal experience with to watch with an audience when you realize what type of movie you're watching, and it builds to the best ending I still have seen in the entire festival. A roller coaster of so many things, so many captivating moments that just edge in my seat. The greatest hits, it's about a woman who uses music to actually travel back in time to visit her past relationship, but is that holding her back when a new man walks into her life? Incredibly charming, wonderful chemistry, a wonderful film. Omni Loop starring Mary Louise Parker. And I wanted to see that one, but they, I couldn't get in. Oh, uh, dude, let me tell you. It's a, it's a t stuck in the time moon movie, goes in routes that you don't expect. It's more dramatic and earnest compared to a lot of the other stuck in the time moon movies we have. But Mary Louise Parker and Iowa Debris, who obviously everybody loves, are the reason why you should check this out. But it's really, really wonderful. I, I, I could see you enjoying it as well. What was your favorite film from South by Southwest? So far, currently, Civil War. Civil War surprised me. Civil War, thought by Alec Garland. This may be my favorite Garland film. Civil War, uh, Alex Garland, I think, is one of the best uh, writers and filmmakers working today. A very intense, powerful film. And it's one that I think you need to sit and process with, because it's not politically picking a side, but it has a lot it's saying by just the imagery. Like, it's just, it's no agenda, all image. And I love the story and powerful and just like, very scary if this type of thing would happen in real life, you know? And it's very scary that this movie that we just saw could be real. Totally immersive experience. I was telling Sean, like, why is he able on smaller budgets to pull off completely believable immersive effects that uh, films with much bigger budgets are often unable to do? The cinematography was great, the music was good, and I thought the act, the performances were great, honestly. Um, adore Civil War. In third place, The Idea of You, and this is a fun one because this is the one movie at South by Southwest that I was able to get my wife into. It's another world premiere. This was of an Anne Hathaway film based off of a book that I have not read. Uh, we were in the front rows when they did the Q&A afterwards. Anne Hathaway was 10 feet in front of us, which was very cool. And this is another one where Anne Hathaway came out and was basically crying over the response from the people in the room and how positive the reaction was. And it was a film that was very personal to her and therefore it meant a lot that it, it was received so well. But uh, yeah, so essentially it's based off a book I haven't read and the basic setup is this 40-year-old divorced woman ends up dating a 24-year-old star of a boy band. And the basic set, when I heard that, I was like, what's this movie going to be? This feels pretty far-fetched and silly, but it plays it all very real and grounded. It's absolutely a fantasy. It finds a way to anchor all of the conflict, disagreements in real insecurities. And Anne Hathaway, when she came out on stage, I think articulated some of what it does really well in it, where she said that, Coming-of-age stories are almost always about youth, 
about young people coming of age, but we're all still coming of age. We're all still figuring ourselves out. No matter how successful you are or how old you are, you're still becoming who you're going to be. And that's kind of what this, this movie's about, where two people that don't really belong together, there's a lot of complications, but there's other ways in which they complement one another. It, it, it can be really funny, but it's very organic humor woven throughout the entire story. And then as a romance, I felt that it um, it tapped into a degree of um, the romantic tension in the scenes in a way that you know, like I don't feel like I, I've sensed in a film since like The Notebook, where you're just like waiting for these two people to kiss. I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought that I would. And perhaps it was just because it was a very cool experience to get to watch the movie and have then have Anna Hathaway 10 feet away from us. Our runner up, The Fall Guy. And this was my one of my most anticipated films of 2024. I feel like David Leach delivers very fun, enjoyable blockbusters. And this one seemed like it combined a number of genres that I enjoy, where it's a big action movie, but it's also a comedy, and it's also a rom-com at its core as well. And this was its world premiere once again. So you had Ryan Gosling and Emily Blunt right there in the room, as well as the rest of the cast. That's a really fun, cool way to watch a movie like this. And I thought it delivered exactly what I hoped that it would deliver. This is a movie to me that I evaluate on like the date night scale. How good of a date night do I think that this movie will be? And I watched it and I went, my wife is going to love this movie. It's got just a little bit of everything that that she enjoys. She's a big Emily Blunt fan and it has action without going dark or gory or truly violent while having romance, comedy, all of that fun stuff. Uh, movie stars oozing with charisma, especially coming after last year where uh, Ryan Gosling doing Ken was so enjoyable for so many people. And this is the action version of funny Ryan Gosling pining over a girl. And you just get that for the whole runtime of him just being so funny, so charming. And so, uh, and it's also a film that celebrates movies. It's all about a stuntman and making a movie. So it's like, celebrating all these people behind the scenes. Like Ryan Gosling talked about how there's a scene in the movie where Ryan Gosling gets into a car to do a stunt as the stuntman in the movie. And the guy that buckles his belt is the stuntman that actually is about to do the stunt that he's going to do. Then in the movie, they go do the sequence where this car flips in the air like eight times and set a world record. Ryan Gosling gets out of the car and the stuntman that just did the stunt Pats Ryan Gosling on the back to congratulate him for the stunt. And all these nice little details, like celebrating filmmaking, celebrating stuntman, has a lot of cool practical stunts in it. So it's got action, comedy, romance, and um, it's about filmmaking without being pretentious. So I thought it was a great one. But coming in at number one, Civil War. And this was a film I was very curious about because I watched the trailer and I went, that looks like a movie that I'll really enjoy. Like, But it's also from Alex Garland, the director of Men. It's coming out in an election year and it's about a civil war in the United States. And you go, oh boy, what on earth? Are, where are they going with this film? What are they going to do? How polarizing is it going to be? How is it going to ex upset people? And is it going to find a way to be able to be thrilling and exciting while also tackling whatever ideas it wants to say about the potential for civil war in the current United States. And I thought it just found like the, the perfect balance of all of that. And a big part of that is that it's not a movie really looking to preach at the audience. It's not telling you what to think. It's much more of a mirror film. It's holding up a mirror and saying, like, look at this, look at it, look at what's happening. Where do you see yourself in this movie? Stop and think about it. Stop and think about how you're behaving now that could push us towards something in the future. And so the, the movie just kind of plays you, it's like a road trip movie across the United States during this civil war. And it just shows you all these different people and their perspective on what's happening in each of the different people represent different ways that people perceive of the current tension in the United States right now. There's like a sequence where 
they find themselves in the middle of a shootout and they're talking to someone like, do you even like, who are you shooting at? I'm shooting at the guy shooting at me. Well, who are they? They're the guy shooting at me. Why are you trying to shoot them? Because they're trying to shoot me, you idiot. And they don't even know who they're, they're fighting with. They don't know why they're fighting with them. They're just fighting because they're fighting for fighting's sake. And it just touches on all of these things without needing to lecture the audience. Doesn't tell the audience what to think. It just holds up a mirror and puts up images and you draw your own conclusions from them. The other thing that it does really well is it's consistently thrilling and exciting and horrifying. There's all of these images that are beautiful, but gut-wrenching, where you'll drive through a city and there's these images of the town burning and sparks falling from the sky and it's just gorgeous to look at, but it represents the nation burning. And it keeps doing that, finding the beauty in the worst of circumstances. Um, It delivered a great experience and one that got me thinking, one that delivered awesome images and one that was thrilling and exciting at the same time. So it comes in at number one. Once again, I want to thank today's sponsors, BetterHelp and Factor. You can check them out at the link down below in the description. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies and TV.